How's everybody doing this morning? Good. If it's your first time here, or you hadn't been here long, I hadn't had the pleasure to meet you. My name is Justin Klinger. Um, been here for quite some time. Um, glad to be here. Glad to serve. I was given the opportunity on Father's Day um, to speak, and uh, during this Psalm series, I was given another opportunity here. Um, I've prepared my heart. Um, but over the last week, uh, I have not been able to prepare my words, um, so we'll be relying heavily on the Holy Spirit here. Um, like I said, my heart and the content is prepared. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to prepare my words. Uh, the slides this morning, um, we're going to have main points. Uh, the scriptures will not be there. We're having technical, technical difficulties. Got hit with a pretty heavy migraine last night. Um, just attack, attack, attack. So I give that caveat to say it's fitting because the uh, Psalms 37 is what we're covering, but the main theme throughout this is going to be that failure is not fatal. So it's not a lack of preparation. It is on the side of that causes uh, failure, sorry, on some cases. Some cases failure is uh, something that we do not have necessarily have control of, right? So. If you need notes, you can raise your hands. We have somebody ready to provide those. I want to give that caveat. I'm going to say a, a quick prayer, settle myself in, and get us ready. Cool? All right, Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for meeting here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to continue to flow. You are here. May my words not be spoke, but yours. Empty me so that I can deliver your message to these wonderful people. Lord, we ask that you would cover us today, that you would calm us today, and that your word would be spoke, that your word would be seen. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts and change lives in your name. So Psalm 37 is a psalm of David. It's a psalm of David uh, that was written later in his life. He said, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen a righteous man forsaken or their children begging bread. That statement right there tells us, one, this was towards the end of David's life when he was an older man. Uh, it also shows us this is a, a chapter, a, a psalm of wisdom. I'm not the most artistic. I'm not the, you give me a, a, a dense poem and I'm probably not going to understand it. What I cling to are things like this, right? These, these books of wisdom because I know I'm a fool. So when we look at these things, uh, in today's society, we have access to more information than we've ever had access to before, am I right? Such fingertips, education, the school systems are more robust than they've ever been previously. You could argue, would we say that people today, on average, are smart? Partially a joke right? The answer is no, not really. We don't say, man, we're smarter than we've ever been. Because if you look back in history and you see some of the things that we've developed and some of the things that people developed across the world, I think the average person today is maybe not as smart as what our legacy used to be. So I say that to say that is knowledge. David gained knowledge over the course of his life, right? But over the course of his life, he made mistakes. He had failures. Just to list a few, he had failures of lust and deception. That's in 2 Samuel 11. Failures as a parent. His own son rebelled against him and tried to overthrow him as king. He had failures of pride. He didn't trust God's provision, so he took a census when God told him, I got this. Failures of fear, trust, Faith, he had failures of judgment where he failed in his own judgment. Yet, when we read about David, it says that he's a man after God's own heart. It says that he's a, a man that is to be modeled in many ways. That's how we teach David. Because he, he had many victories as well, right? Where are some of his victories? As a young man, he said, took out Goliath. 
So there's a concept, um, this is not my original thought, but there's a concept uh, from David and Goliath when David steps up and says, I don't need your armor, I've got God on my side. Like, man, that is emboldened faith, that he was emboldened by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit came down and rested him in that moment, and I agree, but there's a concept. What did he say? He said, I've tended to my father's sheep. In the fields, I've fought lions and bears. Not a lion and a bear, but lions and bears. Those small victories prepared him for that fight. So his faith was gained over time. So we're going to fail. One thing we say here is that failure is not fatal. Now, if you read th- Psalms 37, you may say, man, I don't, I don't see that blanketly, like that blanket statement that failure is not fatal in there, and you'd be correct. What this is, is this is a synopsis of my findings of what David's life and what it brought him to, which is to provide, this, provide us this wisdom. So the first point that I would bring, and that's on the notes, is that knowledge informs, wisdom transforms. So we're going to be about wisdom today. Okay? So theme throughout, failure is not fatal. Let's learn some wisdom. How do we learn wisdom? How do we gain wisdom? Knowledge is information, facts. They're learned, they're studied, they're aver- ob- observed. You can have lots of facts, right? You meet a 10-year-old that likes to study or likes to learn, they can give you a lot of facts, right? You'd be like, man, I did not know that. Would we say that that 10-year-old is necessarily wise? In some ways, no. So what is that? What is wisdom? So wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. It's often gained through experience, particularly through failures and humility. It's when we are humbled that we learn our greatest lessons. It's when we stumble that we learn our greatest lessons. So if you want to pray for wisdom, which is James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So you want wisdom? Pray for wisdom, but be prepared to fail. Because what that means is if you take that, that piece of wisdom that you want to gain or that, that overarching ask of God make me wise, you have to put yourself out there. You don't gain wisdom by standing back and watching. You gain knowledge by observation. You gain wisdom by doing. You're going to do some things. You're going to make some steps. You're going to start walking forward you're going to step on a pebble, right? So that's the the overarching concept that we're going over today. So Psalms 37, 5 through 6, says, Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. So this is David. Go read Psalms 38, and you'll be like, that's not the same person. Psalms 38 is a a psalm of lamenting. I'm wretched. I'm horrible. I'm, I'm messed up. I can't do anything. My enemies are devouring me. These are the words that David is speaking. And yet, at the end of his life, he says that he will make you righteous, your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. It will not always be bright. It will not always be rainbows. But in the end, if you are Christ's and you are in Christ, you will shine like the noonday sun. Psalms 37.30 says, The mouth of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongues speak what is just. So how do we start to apply the knowledge we have to turn that to wisdom. One quick way is our mouths. 
the words that we use and the way that we speak, even a fool is thought wise if he keeps his mouth closed. Right? Man, that person is um, like mysterious. That person, they're, they're, they're sage. They may not have any wisdom, but they're wise enough to keep their mouth closed. So sometimes, just saying, that's this joke, you're allowed to laugh. Sometimes, we just need to keep our mouths closed, right? You ever heard the saying, bite your tongue? Yeah, I'm, I gotta make my eyes water sometimes to keep myself in a place of wisdom. There's a couple of statements that I would say about wisdom and knowledge, um, and I didn't put these on your notes, and I wish I would have, so get ready to describe. Knowledge challenges your mind. Wisdom changes your life. So knowledge challenges your mind, but wisdom changes your life. Knowledge is theoretical, where wisdom is practical. So we say the actual definition is the practical application of knowledge. Psalms 37 is just that. You read through it, and it provides practical application of knowledge. David refers to the wicked 16 times in this psalm. but it's always in contrast to the righteous. We have two paths. We have the wicked, we have the righteous. Can we make ourselves righteous? That's what we're gonna explore a little bit. That's what we're gonna look at. Where we put our focus matters. Where we put our focus matters. So my second point that I'm gonna walk through is your perspective shapes your path. So your perspective, what you see, how you see things, shapes the steps you take. So it's not just getting our words right, it's getting our minds right. So how do we get our minds right? There was an experiment that was done um, by two psychologists back in the 90s and they had two teams of people with basketballs. I would show you, it's copyrighted. They asked that you don't do that, so we're gonna, we're gonna respect those, those wishes. You can look it up. Um, Daniel Simons, if you look that up and look at the, uh, the, I forget what they call the experiment, but it's the ape theory. Um, you can't do it now, because I'm gonna tell you what the clue is. There's two teams. There's a team that's wearing white, and there's a team that's wearing black. They're asked, or they're not asked, you are asked to focus on the team that's wearing white and tell them how many times they pass a basketball. So these guys are running all around and they're passing a basketball. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So you're counting. If you focus hard and you count, 15 times they pass the basketball. If you have good focus, you can see that they've passed the basketball 15 times. What over 50% of people failed to realize as a person from the left side of the frame in an ape costume walked right into the middle of the ongoings, pounded their chest like a fake ape, and lumbered off. Over 50% of people watching that missed that whole interaction. Once you see it, it's hard to miss. But it's, an, it's a clear demonstration that our focus determines our path. So our perception determines our path. So what we're looking at, what we're focusing on, what we're choosing to give our time is gonna be that thing that gives direction. And that's the lens we're gonna see through. If you drive by the, uh, by the graveyard, you don't see 100 people camping out because they're ostracized from society because you're focused on the road ahead of you. 
Are we focusing in the right places? So that's a question. It is easy to get distracted today. So what you focus on shapes your reality and influences how you respond. And that includes how you respond to failure. I'm gonna tell a story about a, started as a young man, we're gonna go over the course of his life. This young man was an inventor in the 1800s. He saw early success because he took the telegraph machine and was like, oh, we can, we can make this better. And he made the telegraph machine better, became a household name. But after that invention, he moved and he created, he had this great idea and he created an electronic voting machine. So in the 1860s, this man developed an electronic voting machine. Spent this time developing this thing. It's like boom, perfect, works well, works awesome. Then he tries to go get it implemented. No, the 1800s, they're like, we're not trusting that machine, we're gonna count. It's like, but it'll save time, it's gonna save effort. It's gonna instill trust over time because people will learn that this is more accurate than human beings. No, failure. Next, he developed an electronic pen. So, 1800s, don't even have lights on at your house. This guy's putting a, taking a battery, putting a tiny motor on it for an electronic pen. And the purpose of that was, he basically created the first tattoo machine. If anybody has tattoos or seen them. So it's a needle that oscillates extremely fast. The purpose of this pen was you take the paper, you lay it out, you'd write what you would need to write in mass, then it would create hole, a hole with your word and create a stencil. Then you could slap it on a piece of paper, roll ink over the top of that paper, slap it on the next one. Basically made the, the printing press had been invented. That's huge, right? This was small application, small business. However you look at that, well, it was too loud. It was too noisy. It was too expensive. Failure. Couldn't sell it. Failure. He goes on. After selling pens or trying to sell pens and not being successful there, to creating baby dolls that have a voice box in them. Thinking, surely kids will love this. They didn't. Failure. They do now, but it's a couple hundred years later, right? He saw some success with a foil phonograph. So he took a foil phonograph. It was cheap, it was easy, um, but it was hard to operate. It was hard to use. The little foil that you used to describe whatever you said that somebody else could then take and play back. So a phonograph is a machine. You put it in there, you spin it, and you talk into it, and it makes etchings. And when you play those reverberations, what you said comes out. It was too difficult to use. The average person couldn't do it. Basically, had to be an engineer to make it work. Engineering marvel. None of, and, and mind you, none of these failures were failures to create. These failures was focusing on the wrong things. So where was his focus? His focus was on the machine and the development of the machine, not on, hey, does anybody even want this thing? Next, he tried to, not, he tried to create, um, again, back in the, the mid-1800s, he's like, hey, concrete homes. They're fast, it'll be cheap, it'll be easy to implement. Puts his effort towards that. No. Next thing you know, the man's like, okay, okay, I'm gonna shift my focus a little bit, go to, towards consumer things that people like, people love music. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the Netflix of of discs. So he was using records in a mail order service. They'd mail you 20 records, you take what you want in the subscription, send the next on to the next person, you mail it to the next person. So in the 1860s, 1870s, he's developing 
old school Netflix, I guess some people may not know. So Netflix, when it started out, is you would get a CD in the mail, and it was, it was a DVD. You get the DVD in the mail, you'd watch the movie, you'd send it back to Netflix, and they'd send you another DVD. If you didn't send it back, they'd charge you for it. So, failure. This goes on and on. Failure, failure, failure. He sees, okay, shifts his focus a little bit and says, I'm going to look at an industry that needs help, and I'm going to focus in that industry, and spends 10 years in the ore industry working on a machine that was bound to failure from the beginning. So he goes from engineering marvels, engineering marvels, to losing the focus of his engineering. And now he's cutting corners and just trying to make it work, fights for 10 years to make this thing work, waste a decade of his life. So famously, he was quoted saying, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> if you know who I'm talking about, it's Thomas Edison. Like him, hate him, doesn't matter. Fact is, the man's focus was in the wrong places. But does that mean he was an utter failure? No. Anybody heard of GE, General Electric? Anybody heard of an incandescent light bulb? Yeah. Some of these failures were after he had already seen success. He already had the roadmap. He wasn't good at the implementation in some areas. Sometimes his designs got so far over here that it's like Cybertruck. People go, I don't know. Right? Some people love it. Engineering marvel. Other people go, I just, I just can't. So what can we learn from Edison? One, failure is not fatal. Man made a huge impact in the world. Like his ethics or not, he made a huge impact in our world technologically speaking. He developed companies. Those weren't just the only companies he developed. He developed companies that changed the face of the earth. So if Edison chose to focus on his failures, where do you think we'd be? Somebody might have figured it out. But it would have been in a different way, right? Somebody else may not have figured it out. There were lights. They just weren't as easy, long-lasting, and safe as the Edison light bulb. People were working on it. Somebody would have figured it out eventually. But the face of our earth would look different if he chose to focus on his failures rather than focusing on the successes or the next endeavor. Seems like he just didn't care about the failures. Drop them, let them roll. So focusing on something besides failure is easy enough to say. But I don't understand because you are a sinner and you have roadblocks that I wouldn't understand. And you're right. But our third point is that failure is not fatal. Where do we pull that from? Looking at Romans 7, 15, through 20, Paul is giving, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it, it's loopy and gets confusing, but Paul is saying, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. He goes on later to say, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is I, this thing I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. We talk about we have a sinful nature. If we allow the failures of our day-to-day -day to stop us from moving forward, and we live in the past, we will never advance. We will never overcome. And God has called us to be overcomers. Following that, he says, so I find, the, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. 
For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I just, but I, sorry, I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. So we ourselves cannot overcome the sin that is within us. You must rely on the sacrifice of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to change. Brings me to a saying that a man named John Wooden said, he's a coach, he's also a Christian. He said, failure is not fatal, sound familiar? But failure to change, failure to not change might be. So failure is not fatal, but a failure to change, it might be fatal. So what am I talking about today? We talk about wisdom is the application of knowledge. We talk about wisdom is the things that we learn through failures. Through, so am I talking huge moral failures? Maybe, but no. I'm talking about the day-to-day grind, our every day. So we have to shift our focus to focus on the right things. I got way too many stories and examples here, so we're just gonna slide, slide on to the point. When we focus on the past, where do we stay in the past? When we focus far in the future, what do we miss? The present, the now. We all know this inherently. But within us, if we don't focus on our failures, we can move forward. But if we don't look at our failures, learn from our failures, and move forward, we will never become wise, which means we don't grow. So my challenge is for you to grow by looking at the failures day to day, and I'm talking small failures, right? I'm saying, man, I'm going to, next this next week, I'm going to spend 20, mi- 20 minutes in devotion in the morning. The first day, I spent three. The second day, I spent none. The third day, I spent 10, like, okay, we're, we're recovering, we're recovering. And then the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh day, I forgot and didn't do it at all. Well, I guess I can't build my devotional life, right? Like if I can't even do, no, that's not how that works. That failure is not fatal. That failure should not stop you from making the advances. Start smaller. If you said 20 minutes and you can't even carve out 20 minutes, do five. Find that level of goal that will, will set you on a path where you, where you are going to fail. You are going to fail as we pursue this life of Christianity. Because why? Romans 7. We're sinners. We're broken. In our depths, we're broken. But it's okay, because we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is active in your lives, go back and listen to the Holy Spirit series. If you have not, that will make that abundantly clear. If the Holy Spirit is active in your lives, he is advancing you, moving you forward. There's a book called 12 Rules for Life. It's by Jordan Peterson. Again, people can look at character. They can say there's people, some people like him, some people don't. The fact is the man is a, is a clinical psychologist and there's something, some things he learned in his practice. One of them, which is the fourth rule for, that he gives for life, I think is very key and is, it keens in on what we're talking about. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not who someone else is today. Comparison is the killer of progress. Well, well, they're, they're, who cares? Where are you? Focus on where you are today and where you, are, are yet, where you were yesterday. If you were yesterday, 
not where you are today, but further behind today than you were yesterday. By yesterday, I don't mean physical yesterday, I mean the past. If you're not advancing and moving forward in life, that's what Next Steps is for, to help you trudge that path. That's what small groups are for, to help you meet with other people, to rub iron sharpens iron. We get in there, we work together, we rub shoulders, we have communications. I see where you are today, but guess what? I, I'm not gonna compare myself to where you are today. I'm gonna compare myself to where I was yesterday, and your story of where you are today compared to where you were yesterday can be that inspiration for someone else. That's the purpose of small groups. That's the purpose of next steps. This isn't just a pitch for those, but it is the truth. As we move forward, failure is not fatal, but the failure to change will be. I'm not gonna say might, I say will be. Because if we don't let the Holy Spirit work in our lives, then we're failing. But again, that failure is not fatal. So let's walk a path of small incremental advancement that'll change our lives so that we can change the lives of people around us. Amen? Is that good? Does that make sense? So I want to pray. I want to pray for everyone. Um, and I'm going to ask us to pray if you are at that place in life, and I think we all are, so I think we can all pray as well as help others to be comfortable. We're at that place in life where we just need to focus on what that next small change is, what that next small thing is. If we need to focus on that next small thing, let's keep the main thing the main thing, right? Let's focus on that next small step. So I'm gonna pray that over the next week, the Holy Spirit would reveal to each of us, myself included, What's my next small incremental change that I can make that will advance me towards whatever goal I wanna set? Father, I thank you for everyone here, everyone online, for the lives that they influence, the people that they touch, the people that they are around. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would enter into our lives on a daily basis. We know that you are always speaking, but we fail to perceive it. Help us to be silent. Psalm 37, that's actually one of the steps, is says to be silent. Sit and wait for the Lord. So Holy Spirit, we wait for you. Just like the song today said, we wait for you. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we thank you for that. So oh God, we ask that, again, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would give us those small incremental changes that we can make. Holy Spirit, quicken us to hear that. If something flashed before you right now that you've been avoiding tackling, don't avoid it. Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is active. Listen. We won't tackle it all, all big at once. We will take it piece by piece. We will get people with us that will help us walk. This is the first time you've heard a message like this. You're like, yeah, I, 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 I agree with the broken, I agree with the sinful, but I don't know how to get forward, I don't know how to move forward, and I don't know, even know how to ask for help. We can help you with that today. So I'm gonna ask everyone to pray with me in case somebody next to you needs to pray out loud. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask that Christ would come into our lives, that he would change us. Jesus, I thank you for who you are and what you did. 
thank you for convicting me. I am a sinner. I am broken. And I want you to make me whole. Come into my life. Change me. Holy Spirit, I don't know you, but come into my life and show me those small changes. Surround me with your love and put people in my life that can guide me. Amen. Father, I thank you again for everybody here. Lord, I ask that you would settle hearts, settle minds. Speak to us over the course of this week for the content that is there. Now, on the notes, there's a lot more there. Um, apparently, I over-prepared. Um, I think I got the highlights, though. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. I'd like to bless everybody out. Pastor Tom isn't here. Uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity to have the pleasure of blessing everybody out. Is that okay? Cool. If everybody wants to stand up and raise our hands, we will ask that God blesses us. Mm. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. This week as you leave this place, may you see the impact of the Holy Spirit in your life that you would see the small incremental change in front of you, that you would compare yourself to the yesteryear, and you would see the advancement that you have made. You have not failed 10,000 times, but you know what doesn't work. May you be blessed and have a wonderful week. If you need prayer, back in the corner, we've got uh, at the prayer station over there, we have people who are ready to pray for you. If it is your first time accepting Jesus Christ in your heart, welcome. They can help you as well. If you're a first time guest, last thing, we've got a, the card in the seat back in front of you. You take it out front. There'll be somebody with a, a lanyard that says, how may I help you? And they can help you. Amen. Be blessed, everybody.